Good. And then uh, I'm giving the talk today on uh, science and the presidential transition. Um, as I usually do, I when I give talks, I would like to ask for questions first. So if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to uh, make now so I can incorporate them into the talk, I have a pen, I have a piece of paper here, and I would be happy to write anything down. So if you have any questions now, Chime in. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious about uh, how deep the um, the patronage appointments go in in all the relevant agencies, and how much is civil service. Okay. And how much is, uh, and how, which ones of those are approved by the Senate, which will. Yeah, yeah, that'd be another thing too. Yep. Yeah. Other questions, other things of interest. So I'm going to ask, um, when does the transition begin? When's it end? Uh, what rules regulate it? And uh, what's the calendar? between the beginning and the end. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. So let's do this. And let's cut out of that. Let's go here. Slideshow. Okay, and then I'm gonna do that. and go backwards. Okay, so um, part of what I'm gonna base this on is um, what I saw 20 years ago and what I saw 12 years ago. 20 years ago, I was a Congressional Science Fellow with the House Committee on Agriculture that was chaired by Mr. Combest from Lubbock, Texas. He was a Republican, that meant, and uh, I work for the majority staff, I work for the chairman, um, so, I got to see the Clinton to Bush 43 transition. And then 12 years ago, I was a speechwriter for the director of the National Science Foundation and got to see the uh, Bush 43 to Obama transition. I started uh, the first week of November. The election was kind of late that year. I think it was the 6th or the 7th of November. Um, presidential elections in Washington, D.C. Uh, and in the Washington, D.C. area for federal employees is a day off. So uh, at the Monday before the election, we went to work. We didn't go to work on Tuesday. Uh, the next day was Wednesday after the election. And the transition team for Obama was already in the White House. Oh, excuse me, it was already in the NSF building. And the irony is the, the only person who was assigned to be on the team for transition at the National Science Foundation from the Obama campaign was a friend of mine, uh, Michelle Murray, from um, when I was a Congressional Science Fellow. So it was pretty interesting to see how things uh, developed from those two different transitions. So those were both um, eight-year presidents. <clears throat> Excuse me. Clinton was uh, president for eight years, and Bush 43 was president for eight years. They were both transitions from one party to another, uh, and they both had very different approaches. Clinton, Bush, and Obama um, had very different views on science and the roles of science and policy. Um, Clinton and Obama being pretty favorable towards science, Bush considered not so much. Oh, here we go. So why is there a transition? Uh, why is it so long? When does it begin and end? What constitutional angles guide it? What legal statutes regulate it? And what leading precedents form it? This is pretty interesting to me because uh, got to remember a good chunk of our 
governmental calendar still harks back to 1787 and the Constitution that went into effect in 1788 with the election of uh, George Washington. Um, the UK system at that time that they were familiar with was a monarch with a privy council. Uh, the prime minister didn't necessarily, if there was one, didn't necessarily even sit in the House of Commons. And there's always been this balance between parliament and uh, the crown. So we're used to this idea that there's a time distinction between when the monarch um, accesses the throne <clears throat> and when they're crowned. And that can be up to a year uh, or more. But the monarch is the monarch from the time the previous monarch dies and parliament acclaims the new monarch. Uh, the powers of the monarch in the UK now are very limited, but we still hark back to that idea that, gee, we're used to an idea of a time um, between heads of state. And our president is also head of government, which is one of the big problems. So we're also used to, in modern times, seeing the UK prime minister. Uh, they have to have an election, I think it's every five years. They can call snap elections. Um, whether the prime minister is uh, defeated in a division of the house or whether the prime minister is elected in an election, they have to go see the monarch and kiss hands, literally is called, and then that's, that's they're now prime minister and head of government with a cabinet in the UK. And there's a very short time between the elections and the new prime minister. And that's very different than what we have here. And in parliamentary systems, which would include Canada and Australia and New Zealand that I know of and possibly some others, um, the executive offices of the head of government, um, those folks are part of the elected legislature. They're part of the parliament. And in the US, our constitution explicitly forbids that. If you're in the executive department, you cannot be part of the, uh, you cannot sit in Congress. And the only exception to that is the constitutional office of the vice president of the United States, who is also president of the United States Senate. So this means that from the British point of view, um, the opposition parties always have what are called shadow governments. Um, they always have shadow ministers. They have, even though they're out of power, they have uh, their designated person who, if they were to come into power, would be likely the person who would become um, secretary of this or secretary of that portfolio. So chancellor of the exchequer or first lord of the admiralty or Home Secretary or whatever the British system is. And we don't have something that explicit or specific um, in the US. And so our transition is very different than our neighbors to the north in Canada or to Britain. Uh, the other thing that's different between the United States and the island of Great Britain or the United Kingdom with uh, Northern Ireland and Great Britain is the geography. Uh, it's hard to remember, but in 1787 and 1788, the fastest you could go was in a horse, was on a horse, and the fastest you could really travel great distances was the horse drawn coach. Excuse me. <clears throat> Trains didn't come into much being until the 1830s. The telegraph wasn't even invented until 1837. Um, it's pretty interesting to see what Andrew Jackson did in his eight years um, when he left the Hermitage, uh, his ancestral home in I think it was 1829. It took him several weeks to get to the, get to Washington DC and it took him just several days to get back after his eight years because the train service had expanded so much. And so this geography and time and sequence is kind of cooked into our original constitution. We have an election in November. Uh, we're actually not electing the presidents were electing electors. Uh, the electors gather in December. Each set of electors gather separately in each state. Um, then the electors have to send a certified message to the seat of government and they send it to the president of the Senate, who is also the vice president 
of the United States and who has on occasion also been a candidate for presidency of the United States. And I'm thinking in January of 2001. So the original seat of government was New York City. That's where uh, George Washington was sworn in and then District of Columbia. So you'll see in some of the um, laws that it refers to things being delivered to the seat of government um, without designating which city it might be. So a few other things about the original 1787 Constitution. Um, I don't think anybody envisioned parties at the time. And of course, George Washington spoke pretty vociferously against parties, but that didn't keep parties from popping up. And by the time uh, Washington retired and Adams was elected, Adams' vice president was Jefferson, not because they ran on the same ticket, but because Adams got more electoral votes than Adams, than Jefferson did. Jefferson came in second, and so he was uh, vice president, and they didn't like each other at all. So the 12th Amendment changed that process so that the electors um, were selecting a ticket of what we call today a ticket of the vice president and the vice president tied together, and they're elected by the electors or by the House on occasion, especially the disastrous election of 1876. Because of that uh, election in 1876, there was a law passed um, in 1887. Uh, one party controlled the Senate, the other party called, controlled the House in 1887, and they were able to set up what's called the Electoral Count Act. And that provided two things that I think you're gonna hear about or have already heard about. One is this phrase, safe harbor, um, which you, may remember hearing um, during the Bush v. Gore uh, um, court cases in December of 19, excuse me, in December 2000, and then the word ascertainment, an ascertainment process by the states. Um, this is a little bone I like to hang out there because I work at a college or a university and people call it the electoral college and I'm just like to point out there's there is no college they're not colleagues they don't meet together they're just electors they're not professors they gather in 51 places the 50 state capitals and the district of columbia the district of columbia has three electoral votes um, there's no conversation no debate no deliberation they just vote they vote once they're one and done and there's nothing collegial about it um, but it's going to be very important because of the possibility of faithless electors and all that good stuff. So here are the recent transitions. Um, to bear in mind, Reagan to Bush, same party. Uh, so that was 12 years of Republican control of the presidency from January of 81 through January of 93. Bush 41 to Clinton, Clinton to 43. Um, Bush 43 in 2001 so the most controversial transition until this one. Uh, Bush 43 to Obama in 2009. Uh, then Obama to Trump, which I don't remember a whole lot of uh, issues about the transition per se. There's a lot of bitterness about the election, but I don't remember a lot about the transition not going well. And then Trump to Biden right now. So there's a law called the Presidential Transition Act of 1963. And what's cool to me about this is to see how thoughtful even 50 years ago people were about this because, you know, um, October of 1962 when we had a missile crisis and the whole idea of you know, devastating wars at a moment's notice kind of focuses your mind. And so several things changed. And one of these is how are we gonna make sure we have a smoother transition of presidents so that we don't put the country at um, not only a national security risk, but also a domestic tranquility risk. So what's cool to me is, whoa, if you ask when did the transition begin, it did not begin the morning uh, after the election. It began in November last year. 
And then you can see there's reports that are um, mandated by this statute from 1963 in May and in August. Um, there are the two in this timeline are the two national conventions and that's big because by then you know who the leading candidates are going to be for the two major parties. Um, that means they start putting together a transition team at that time. And those transition teams are large. This part of the transition is paid mostly by the um, campaign of each party, the presidential campaigns. Um, and that had to be permitted under the campaign laws um, so that they could spend transition money, not on campaigning, but on setting up a transition. So uh, four years ago, when we knew there was going to be a new president, um, one way or the other, both parties had to have a transition team. Um, this year, when the sitting president was going for a second uh, administration, the second term, um, it's not so clear to me exactly what uh, President Trump had for a transition team, if any. But the Bush, excuse me, the Biden-Harris team uh, was already getting in place. And you can see by on September 1 that they were uh, eligible for starting to be consulted and trained and introduced. And regardless of what where they were in the polls or not, the whole idea is you got to have this transition team up and running throughout the whole fall so that um, the transition can be as thorough and as smooth as possible, or at least that's how the statute is, act, uh, is uh, written. So th all the agencies uh, have a November 1 deadline to have the, their briefings for the transition of any incoming president and their team ready. And so that meant that the Trump administration had people designated in many, many departments and agencies that had to put together uh, briefings for the transition team, regardless of who won the, the election. So this year, the election was on November 3rd. It was not called by anybody until the following Saturday, which I think was November 7th. President Trump is still not referring to President-elect Biden as President-elect Biden. And that's a big deal because of the ascertainment issue and the freeing up of um, appropriated money, about $10 million, to be able to pay for the transition work. Um, so although that we have these November 4th dates there, much of that stuff may not be happening right now because the General Services Agency, excuse me, General Services Administrator has not ascertained that Biden won the election. And then you can see the uh, inauguration day. So one of the questions that uh, was asked is how deep does patronage go? There are about 9,000 political appointees between Congress and the executive branch. There are about 4,000 of those are appointed by the president. About 1,200 of those are appointed with the consent of the Senate, that is, they are confirmed. And there's the citation for that number from the Washington Post. And that's a pretty cool graphic if you um, want to go search for that at the Washington Post. Uh, that gives you an idea of why the transition is as long as it is. It's already been running since November 19th of last year. It's going to go another 70 days or so. And that's just to the inauguration and the um, transition in many ways continues because of the hearings for those 1,200 people. Well, they don't all get hearings, but they all have to get voted on and many have to have hearings um, in the Senate. So this long involved transition again raises the question of the future of lame duck sessions for presidents and congresses. We kind of had to have that in 1787. Do we still need to have that now? What does that say about our commitment to the um, respecting the voice of the people when um, a stale Congress still has power after an election has, um, and the people have, or at least the people who voted have spoken? Um, should that transition be shortened again? 
should we have a caretaker status um, be imposed more like the British parliamentary system uh, where the idea is once you uh, go into the election week, you don't do things, uh, you don't make significant changes in legislation or appointments uh, in deference to the the idea that the people are about to speak and you should defer to that. And then, of course, what risks are run in national security and domestic tranquility by having this long period, even between the election and the inauguration. And this is all highlighted even more with uh, the urgency of the COVID pandemic. So this is from yesterday. Um, and you can see Wisconsin is front and center there yesterday and today. Uh, we're completing our canvassing of the election. Uh, if President Trump wants to challenge that, um, he's got till five o'clock today to apply for a recount. Supposedly it's gonna cost him about $7.8 million if he does a statewide recount. Uh, my Twitter feed says that uh, the Trump campaign has filed suit um, contesting the canvassing of uh, Milwaukee County and Dane County, where uh, Dane County is our county. This is surprisingly parallel to what was done in Michigan, which just got resolved late last night, um, where they focused on um, objecting to the canvas of votes in Wayne County, and Wayne County is the county that Detroit is in. And then uh, the 20th is the deadline for California for mail-in ballots. Remember, the states get to regulate uh, how the elections are run. Um, and so we're not even sure what the final count is for the popular vote. Um, and so it's hard to say when a landslide has happened because the votes that come in on Tuesday, on the Tuesday of election don't represent the final counts at all. We saw that in 2018. We saw it again this year. I think we're gonna to continue to see it as long as we have 51 different systems of electing um, the president and members or delegates to the Congress. So now it starts getting interesting. There's that safe harbor deadline um, from the Electoral Count Act, which says if states get it in by this time, um, they can, that's where their electors can be assured to be counted in the um, Electoral College vote. And that was key in 20, in the year 2000, um, because it was a safe harbor argument along with um, uh, equal protection of the laws argument um, that's carried the day in the Bush v. Gore um, lawsuit that the Supreme Court ruled five to four in favor of the Bush campaign and ended the recount in Florida. And Florida was carried by some 557 votes. And then on December 14th, the electors actually meet in the 51 different places. Then they have this process where they need to send certified uh, messages to the seat of government, which will be uh, Washington, DC. Congress swears in at noon on uh, January 3rd. And one of the first things they do is on January 6th, um, count as a joint session of Congress. Um, they will be there as the president of the Senate, Vice President Pence opens the um, messages from each of the 51 uh, electors. So 50 states in the District of Columbia. And if you remember this date, January 6th from 2001, that was when Vice President Gore in his role as president of the Senate, um, had to parry several objections from his people in his own party to go through the count and declare um, Bush 43 the new president. So how big is the transition? Uh, here are there, are, I think, 15 cabinet level departments um, plus from the science point of view, pretty important ones such as the EPA, NASA, um, 
you don't see things like the National Science Foundation, but you do see the Department of Agriculture, which is a big uh, funder of uh, scientific research. Health and Human Services is where the uh, NIH is. That's the largest um, civilian R&D program. Department of Defense has a huge R&D program, part of which is uh, civilian, others are uh, secret. We don't know so much about that. And then um, things like the Department of State that aren't big funders of scientific research, but are big players in how the United States government uses or doesn't use science in foreign policy, in treaties, um, and in participation in organizations such as the World Health Organization, UNESCO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, or the Paris Accords on Global Warming. So those are all pretty big ones. Let's see what we got here. Oh, so that slide died. Um, so this isn't specific to science, but this is pretty cool where the General Services Administration uh, maintains this website to help go through this all. You will see right here, this was last reviewed on January 21 of this year. So this is pretty stale. And there's still nothing there that says President-elect Biden. And that's because the GSA is controlled by folks who report to President Trump. And uh, so far, they have not um, used the term President-elect. They have not ascertained that he is, that Biden is the President-elect. So here we have these um, members from the uh, folks who are communicators from each agency, what they have to do over the year um, uh, of running up to a presidential election. Uh, it's meant so that it's a clean handoff uh, as best as possible and that it's coordinated because it's large, it's complex, it involves policies, regulations, statutes, budgets, the whole workings of the executive branch. Um, and it's not just something you drop and uh, people come by and pick back up behind you. Although there might be some of that this time around. So how did scientists look at this? Um, this is a paragraph from another, from a, a news article, I think it was in Science. Um, people were pretty happy from the scientific community that Biden uh, won. I'd like to point out that the vice president-elect, um, like Obama, uh, both unlike Obama, Obama's mom was a PhD in cultural anthropology. And as far as I know, Obama was the first president who had a parent who was a PhD scientific researcher. Um, Kamala Harris's, both of her parents were scientists. One's an oh, economist, the other's a cancer researcher. Her mother has died and her father's still alive. Um, she lived here in Madison for a year while her parents worked at the university. Um, so that's also a thing that I think folks in the scientific community at large are looking at. So the two big things, of course, are COVID uh, pressing right now and climate change in the long run. Um, the whole affirmation of the science matter and policy, what's the role of data, all this. It's very similar to what we saw eight years, um, excuse me, 12 years ago, going from Bush 43 to uh, Obama. The, feelings that a lot of scientists were under that they were muzzled, ignored, um, or even worse, twisted. And that phrase, denigration of expertise. Oh, sorry about that. 
So the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, are the people that um, put out the journal science, are the people that organize the Congressional Science Fellowship that I worked in in 2000 and 2001. They're about as influential of a professional society as there is, put out this statement. And you'll see that's November 7th, that Saturday, they waited for the news organizations to make the call. Um, and right there you can see COVID, climate change, security, competitiveness. These are things that AAAS is working on all the time. Um, the editor in chief of science, not this person, but the editor in chief um, of the journal has wrote a very scathing editorial a month ago about uh, the Trump, President Trump's um, views and uses and abuses of science. And it was uh, unique in my experience. So we started back in April. There's a justification for it. Uh, the, this is from the Executive Office of the President, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget. That person is a person who, in, although they're in the Executive Office of the um, President, the Director of OMB is subject to confirmation by the Senate. And there's not a whole lot of people who work in the White House directly that um, are, and that person is one of them. You can see that person is even enacting um, back in April under the Trump um, administration. So this is how they uh, go through and do these. The Trump administration has to designate transition directors for each of these agencies. And so that means you're investing time and people's talents in putting together a transition team that you don't know will even have to do anything or much uh, because if your side wins the election, you just pretty much go on um, as you were. Um, so that's what's unusual here. So we have a one term president who ran for a second term and was not reelected. So these folks have a lot of work to do. Now I showed the previously the um, Departments that were cabinet level and almost cabinet level. Here's just a list. You don't have to read that real carefully, but these are all the other agencies that have to provide points of contact for a transition team coming in over the next, from the time between the uh, uh, start of the transition back in September up through uh, January 20th. Some of these things you're not going to, well, I'll say for me, some of these I've never heard of. Uh, some of them are huge. So the National Science Foundation is in here. Uh, the central, uh, let's see, no, that's not in there. Um, NASA is in here. Uh, NOAA is actually part of um, the Department of Commerce, National Oceanic and Aeronautic Administration, Atmospheric Administration, excuse me. So even places in here, here's the National Science Foundation. That's a $9 billion budget and huge in science. And it's in with other things that don't look quite so big. And that's a repeat of the uh, secretary cabinet level um, offices plus um, NASA, a couple other things that are not cabinet level. So that was the Trump side. Here is the Biden side. These are folks that have been designated since back at, um, at the time of the beginning, at the time of the conventions in August. Um, this one surprised me, Broadcasting National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for Humanities, the National Science Foundation, and the Smithsonian Institution. So these are on the order of several hundred million dollars. This is nine billion dollars and huge for those of us in science. Um, and the Smithsonian is a big deal, but it's not a funder of uh, 
research on a large level. Um, and these are the folks that are lead on this. Kai Kozumi was at AAAS, but he was at, um, uh, he goes back and forth between AAAS and uh, a democratic administration. So I met him when he, when I was at um, Congressional Science Fellow, and then I met him again, and he was at AAAS, and then he went to the Office of Science and Technology Policy under the Obama administration, and he went back to AAAS um, during Trump, and he will likely not only be on these transition teams, but will likely have a significant role in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, then there's folks like the environmental quality. What I'm looking here now, is I want you to see the range of folks, where they come from. Uh, many of these folks have been in previous administrations and they'll go, if they're out of power, then they'll go to a university or to a think tank. Um, and then they can be brought back into administration if the party in power changes as is the case now. Catherine Sullivan is a, uh, another example. I think she was at uh, NSF as an honorary person when I was there. Here's the Department of Energy, which is a huge funder of uh, research and um, is a above average player in policy because of nuclear policy, alternative fuels, and the Department of Energy is also responsible for the nuclear warheads, which I've never understood, but there you go. And you can see this energy team will also do two other agencies that uh, are not under the Department of Energy. Um, and then HHS, so this is huge because of the COVID uh, situation. The FDA is part of HHS. The FDA reviews um, vaccines and other drugs. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, um, up until two months ago was the leading uh, center for diseases in the world and able to collect data and share data publicly. And that was all stripped from them and taken to a higher level and uh, loss of credibility for CDC has been significant and how that will be restored will be an interesting story to see. So the folks that are coming in here um, are looking at one of the wider ranging agencies and that includes three really big ones from science, NIH with the research that they do in-house, plus the, I think it's about $30 billion a year that they distribute to um, research universities and other research institutions, plus the CDC, plus the FDA. Um, so this is one that a lot of us in the life sciences are gonna be watching. Uh, the Department of Interior is a big deal because of the, um, Trump administration's uh, regulatory uh, approach to federal lands. They're currently trying to speed up the leasing of drilling rights in the uh, Arctic National Wildlife Reserve, um, uh, speeding up the building of roads and logging in Songus uh, National Forest in Southeast Alaska and other things. So. Part of this is the timing. If you're an outgoing administration, you wanna speed things up and make it harder for the incoming administration to change whatever you do. If you're the incoming administration, you're trying to figure out what you can do to slow things down that you don't wanna have happen and figure out what your legal status is gonna be if you uh, need to go to court. OSTP is a big deal because they work in the White House. They're part of the uh, if you work for OSTP, you work at the, what's called the West Wing, which is not just the West Wing, but it's also the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. Um, but you have to go through the little gates to get there. Um, and 
this is a very big deal to see who's going to be director of um, policy, who's going to be the overall um, science advisor to the president, um, and who the folks are that fill in the various other jobs there. Um, some of you know Professor Joe Handelsman here at um, Madison and the, she's the director of the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery. And uh, I think she was, uh, I'll say, um, number two or number three there for one particular area under the Obama administration. So very high ranking in policy areas. You can see the Kai Kozumi is again here. This is the place that he has already worked in, will probably possibly resume there. Um, what's very interesting in this, this is the Association of Science and Technology Centers. Um, that's the group of, that's the uh, association of people that have hands-on science centers. So I was surprised to see that someone from there was the lead in that. And there's a team like this for all the other departments, but I wanna point out the last one, Office of Management and Budget, and that's because the management and the budget. The OMB is huge in how, th these are the folks that orchestrate the whole executive branch. Um, you have to get there okay in order to give certain levels of speeches. If you're going to go as an executive branch person to um, give testimony on Capitol Hill to either the House or the Senate, your testimony has to be vetted through uh, OMB. They want you to practice what you're going to say and make sure that you're saying everything right. Um, so there's that angle, but there's also the budget angle. And again, the, the director of OMB is one of the few folks who works in the executive office of the president who has to be confirmed by the Senate. So what are we looking at here for transition? Um, as I mentioned before, on January 13th, 117th Congress will gavel in. Uh, what's weird this year is that we have two elections in Georgia for U.S. Senator. And right now it's 50 to 48. The Republicans have 50 senators. The Democrats have 48 to caucus with them. And if the, depending on how this goes, if the Republicans win both or one of these, they will maintain uh, control of the Senate. If the Democrats win both, it'll be tied 50-50 and the vice president of the united states the president of the senate will cast the um, deciding votes and between um and up until january 20th that will be mike pence and so the republicans will maintain control of the senate at least that long and if the democrats win both um then the Senate will be under the control of the Democrats. Then January 6th, be fun to watch this. It's, uh, 20 years after watching Al Gore do it, we'll see what Mike Pence does. The inauguration will be on January 20th. I think it'll be an inauguration like none we have ever seen before. Um, there have been presidents that didn't show up for other people's inaugurations. That would be John Adams and John Adams Jr. John Quincy Adams, I should say. Um, but uh, uh, one doesn't know. And then start the hearings on nominees for executive uh, appointees, and then we'll have the State of the Union address, which includes usually the budget. And so what's usual, unusual about this calendar is um, the new president comes in and almost immediately gives a State of the Union address, and that State of the Union address is primarily a budgetary address. Here's the policies and here's how I'm gonna fund them and how I'm gonna fund them differently than what the previous appropriations have been. Um, and, and so when you have changes of parties, the State of the Union is especially worth watching. So I already touched on most of this, but Keep in mind, if the Republicans uh, control the Senate after the, beyond January 20th, 
That means they will have power to confirm or not to confirm 1,200 appointees in the executive branch, as well as confirming all judicial appointments. And if we've learned anything from the split government here in Wisconsin, it is completely plausible that a Democratic, uh, in our case, governor or Democratic uh, president may face confirmation in the legislature, state Senate or US Senate, uh, controlled by the Republicans, and the Republicans may balk at confirming some, many, or all appointees. There's nothing that says they have to approve them. So we're now looking at key things in uh, science from the point of view of COVID and climate change, also the climate toward science in the sense of we're going to have a big shift in um, the executive branch as to how they look at science and scientists and the idea of what is the nature of knowledge, what's the nature of evidence, um, what happens when the evidence opposes what we think we want to do. Um, and the word that I don't have there that I should have had there, oh, I do have, um, is ideology. And then something that the president can do very quickly as far as science is uh, change the membership of the United States um, in international organizations and protocols. So specifically things like the World Health Organization, um, the Paris Accords, those kinds of things that don't require uh, congressional approval. President can change executive policy right off the bat. So there's a lot of things that could happen uh, late in the afternoon of January 20th. Um, they can, takes a, a little longer, but you can amend or reverse executive orders pretty fast. If you remember uh, President Trump coming in, that was one of the first things that he did upon taking office is sign a lot of executive orders, many of them putting a halt on or re reversing executive orders from the Obama administration. You can put a freeze on regulations, but regulations um, are more procedural and it takes longer to undo a regulation because you, there's a specific process that you go through in the rulemaking, um, uh, but you can at least begin that process. And then the question of the leases for sales of uh, drilling rights and stuff. I'm not exactly sure what that will be, but um, uh, I'm guessing they will do everything they can to stop it because I'm pretty sure the Trump administration is doing everything they can to complete it. And then the budget priorities and restoring morale. Um, it was a big deal and I think it was April 19th of 2009. Um, so it was already February, March, April. It was three months before uh, Obama went to the National Academy of Science and gave a speech that is still one of the key ones to me as a speechwriter at the National Science Foundation. I had nothing to do with this speech except for as somebody was very eager to hear what he said and how he said it. Um, but restoring morale among um, the core of scientists and the science policy folks who work in federal agencies is going to be a big deal and it's going to take even more under Biden than it took under Obama. Um, and especially since um, Trump has issued an executive order changing his interpretation, the presidential interpretation of uh, the civil service protections and who's a career officer and who works uh, at the pleasure of the president. So he's firing people that other presidents would have thought they could not fire um, because they were career officials, not political appointees. And so this is part of the unitary executive theory that um, the Attorney General Barr and others have uh, put forth. So those are some of the things that I think are gonna uh, be at play. I don't know. Uh, the one thing I do know is you don't know, and that's what's interesting about seeing how things unfold. Uh, this just happened a couple of days ago, though, the limits of being an acting secretary. Uh, this is Chad Wolf at the Department of Homeland Security. Um, 
he was never confirmed by the Senate. He's got an acting role and therefore uh, some states attorney generals sued um, asking for relief on DACA um, that the changes that the acting secretary Chad Wolf made and that this order was invalid uh, or because of the uh, he had not yet been confirmed by the Senate so I don't know how much this will happen or not happen, but we've seen it in Wisconsin. It's a parallel. It does, just because it happened here doesn't mean that it'll hold at the federal level, but we have seen um, the difficulties of being able to try to run an executive department at the state of Wisconsin when you're not confirmed. And then if the um, Senate rejects your nomination, then you're out of the job right there and you have to start over. Uh, the governor has to start over by appointing somebody else who then is at, um, serves basically at the displeasure of the Senate. So I, um, I don't know enough about this. This is what I'm going to be interested in seeing if the Republicans do hold the Senate and if the under uh, Senate leader McConnell, they continue to play the level of politics that have been played, I can clearly imagine that um, no appointees might be approved. And that will leave uh, President Biden, not only in science, but in all other areas, uh, trying to find executive order levels to have the government run and to um, press his policies. Um, one of the things I saw as a Congressional Science Fellow working in the House Committee on Agriculture was how often statutes defer to um, the Secretary of a Department. In our case, it would be Secretary of Agriculture. And so secretaries often have great statutory powers. Well, I shouldn't say. They have great deference um, to provided by statutes. Congress has said, we want the secretary to take care of these kinds of decisions. And if that's the case, and you don't have a Senate confirmed secretary, there's gonna be a lot of interesting quandaries pop up. Um, maybe there's some way around that, but that's what concerns me when it comes to science and policy and regulations and the bear on, um, human health and safety and environmental protection. So that's what I'd like to offer and I'd be happy to take any other questions and I will stop sharing and ask if you have any questions now. Well, look, many of you are still awake. That's so good. Hey, Tom, can you yeah. hear me? Yes. Um, when, you know, the year ahead of the um, primary or whatever, um, do third parties figure in at all in any of the transition stuff? Do third parties figure all in any of those? I think they're in, um, one, I've never heard that, too. It's expensive to have transition teams, especially really extensive. The only thing that you can do is use campaign funds to fund a transition team from the time of your um, in the case of the Republicans and the Democrats of the time of their uh, conventions. Um, so if you're a Libertarian Party or a Green Party in the United States where we really don't have much of a third party, a, a multi-party system, it's a two-party system, um, not by statute, but by tradition. Um, I, I don't know what options that they would have. Um, they'd have to pay for whatever they want. They could probably say, I want access. I, I would like to see the briefing binders and that type of thing. Um, and for all I know, that does happen. Um, but I haven't heard of that, and I don't know. I, I don't know why. Very few um, statutes that I'm aware of. I couldn't even name any, but I'm guessing there's some. Specifically, say, um, call out the Democrat and Republican parties only. Constitution has nothing in parties. Um, so that's 
I'm, I'm guessing that's where it is. And that's probably why the it's, it's permitted to use campaign funds right up until the election. And then you get some um, federal access to funds at $10 million. And that's what's being blocked by the general services administrator by not ascertaining that Biden is president elect. But that only goes to one party. Mm, okay. And if, no, if anybody knows it um, different than that, let me know that this is just all my understanding. Yes, go ahead and speak. Tom, oh. uh, the, uh, the, the Congress has been traditionally protective and uh, supportive of NIH, but um, do, do you see that changing uh, regardless of who comes in? Or which way the, co the Congress goes? Uh. Well, even under the Trump administration's budgets, and of course the federal budget means nothing. It's great that the president sends it. He's required to do so by the Budget Act. Uh, oftentimes these huge budgets are back when they were printed would arrive on Capitol Hill and you know, they'd, they, they, um, as, as far as appropriations, the appropriations committees often say, thank you very much. You know, we're gonna go do whatever we wanna do. Um, NIH, you got to keep in mind the average age of the United States Senator. Yeah, and by and large, that's the, how I look at it is like the public is the public has always been very supportive of the NIH, uh, and and so has the United States Congress. So the NIH doubled in size, um, yeah. starting under Bush forty one and then going into right. um, Clinton, I believe. And so this, and you see it on the campuses, of the research universities of the United States. Um, if you look at 1990, who were the leading by budget, the leading universities versus today, the universities that don't have medical schools were, uh, were far more competitive in 1990 than they are today. So if you have a place like Caltech or um, UC Berkeley, that don't have medical schools that are part of them, their relative rank, not in quality, but in mm -hmm. ranking of R&D budget um, has gone down while universities that have um, medical schools go up. The University of California at San Francisco is basically a medical school and it's ranked much higher in R&D than UC Berkeley is. Mm -hmm. And that's the, uh, that's a function of how favorably people have funded, how, pe how favorably Congress and the president have funded NIH. Um, NIH grants tend to be larger and longer than those from NSF, and those from NSF tend to be larger and with higher um, indirect costs than those from say USDA. So people like myself who I don't do research in agriculture anymore, um, but colleagues of mine who do, they are, they're in this quandary. Do I spend my time trying to get grants from USDA or do I go to NSF or can I even go to NIH? And so a place like UW-Madison UW is uh, interesting to watch because when you look at a place like the College of, or the School of Veterinary Medicine and see how much of their funding comes from the USDA compared to how much of their research funding comes from NIH. Um, and the COVID thing being starting in bats and spreading to mink and all this other stuff is only gonna help um, universities like UW-Madison, University of Minnesota, um, Texas Tech, excuse me, Texas A&M, UC Davis, places that have medical schools and veterinary schools because of that NIH funding. And what I say to people is United States senators tend to be old and they tend to have grandchildren. And so they have 
when you ask what is it, what kind of research beyond defense are they going to support? Yeah. Um, that, that's just my feelings. And that's what I thought when I was working on the House Committee on Agriculture. It's like, um, you know, get out your Rodney Dangerfield impression because some of us don't get any respect. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, go ahead. You're muted, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Still can't hear you. Uh, I think you're trying. If, if there you, you move. go. Oh, okay. Are you talking now or is somebody else talking? I, I was talking. I was going to tell her if she hovers her. Okay, uh, I got it. You got it. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I was interested in how much information and how much can, can uh, Biden, is Biden able to get from these agencies? Or well, is there really across the board uh, directive from Trump that nobody can do anything? And this is what's new in my lifetime and I think new probably since John Quincy Adams and Jackson. I don't know of any uh, transition that's been so impeded by the sitting president. And Biden, of course, is saying, oh, it's all right, we, we'll do okay, we'll do okay. I think if you were to ask Biden or anybody else, is this the way you would like it to be? Could it be better? Um, having a cooperative transition is a big deal. And you can get by without it, but it's kind of like driving your car around with the parking brake on. You can do it, but you know, I mean, it's slow and it smells. Trump uh, put out a directive or something to all of these people not, not to uh, cooperate with Biden or? I have read things along that line. I haven't seen, um, the a copy of the directive, but I've seen news stories saying that that is clear that uh, from these news stories that it, he's making it clear not to uh, cooperate with anybody because Biden is not the president elect and you don't have to. So as long as that's the stand, that's why that going back to that ascertainment mm -hmm. um, is a big deal f for the general services uh, administrator. So if he is um, given the, the uh, of, of uh, president-elect, will that automatically allow him access to all these things? Um, by statute, it should allow him access, allow the Biden team access to about $10 million of appropriated money to help speed that. Um, that um, but, but Biden could, excuse me, the uh, current president, President Trump, could still threaten to fire people, especially under his unitary executive approach. Um, he can always fire any a political appointee, and he might be able to fire, um, under his theory of law, mm -hmm. um, people that are career uh, employees, and that would be a very chilling thing. And everybody on the screen has lived through Deep Throat and uh, 1973 and um, Watergate. And that was a long time ago, but we can remember that in our, you know, like my kids are like, what the, what's Watergate? I'm 16, dad. It's like, yeah, okay. So that's why keeping these, keeping alive the crisp memories of how bad things were under in Watergate um, bear on what's happening today because Watergate is what led to the um, Inspector General statutes and those have been under duress with the Trump administration also. So um, other questions, comments?
So one of the things you haven't seen yet, you did um, in the news, you have seen that uh, the, one of the first things that Biden announced were the 13 members of his COVID uh, advisory committee. Uh, then he also announced his uh, climate change folks. Um, I've not yet seen anything, and I was looking this morning for any hints as to who's in the running to run OSTP, Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, uh, under the Obama administration, Obama had a cluster of uh, Nobel Prize winners all through the fall of 2008 as his uh, scientific advising team. I haven't heard of people, uh, I don't know what Biden's advisory team is along those lines. <clears throat> um, I have a question about judges. Yes. The, the Senate, do they have to approve all the judges? At, yeah. at what level are the judges? Well, as far as I know, um, the, uh, all the Senate, excuse me, all the judge appointments have to be approved. There might be levels of the judiciary that um, don't have to be approved, but um, all the federal district judges, uh, appellate judges, Supreme Court justices, those are all uh, approved by the Senate. And the Senate also has these very genteel rules about um, the, the power of a senator to be able to con have great say over which judges get appointed or don't get appointed to federal districts in the state which the senator represents. Um, so that's what we've, it's one of the huge powers of the Senate. The House has nothing like it. Um, the Senate is a continuing body. The House is a discontinuous body. The Senate is much more like a, like I alluded to, in my opinion, I, I think it would be helpful if Americans looked at the Senate more as like a part of the executive branch, because when you can't name and appoint, um, officers in the executive branch without the approval of the Senate, that's a very big deal. You can't say who the people will be, but you can block people from being them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, uh, the, the Senate is a very different animal than the House. And, and I assume that if um, the Republicans win the majority in the Senate, that they'll block most of the judge appointees that Biden would recommend? Uh, based on what they did when Obama was uh, right. nominating people, yes. They certainly have the power to do so. And under Senator McConnell, he's shown his great willingness to do so. So this is the, the, the thing that's going to be new on January 20th, is if the Senate is in control of the Republicans, um, what will be the approach for many of these appointees by President, at that time, President Biden, um, that require Senate confirmation. And like I said, the Senate in Wisconsin, controlled by Republicans, has clearly shown that they are willing to let uh, nominees from the governor not be approved. And then when they do something, when those nominees do something as acting secretary of this agency or that agency, when they do something that the Republicans didn't like, they will reject the nomination and effectively fire them. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if that game plan is something that can happen at the federal government. I don't know why it can't. There's a, one of the things I learned 20 years ago was a astonishing number of congressional staffers who walk around with one of those little paper copies of the constitution in their back pocket. Um, just every now and then they have to remind themselves, well, there is that power right there. And the words do matter. And uh, 
it's it's a very it's a profound power that the Senate has. Yes. Well, the own any um, appropriations or uh, have to start in the House. Appropriations don't. Um, well, taxes, taxes do. Taxes, but any, yeah, other, any any other financial things have to start in the House. And uh, is there any interplay of of tit for tat or something like that that the House can hold up some appropriation bills? If the Senate doesn't or does something else, um, yeah, that, that's a possibility, but I've never heard about it. Um, so I'm I'm guessing that this is where the um, and you've seen many times over the last twenty years the governmental shutdown, and that that is often over a continuing appropriation, mm -hmm. and so. The thing to keep in mind is uh, the federal government uh, fiscal year starts on October 1. So it's a long time from January 20th to October 1. And so that's a long time where you can wait and say, well, we don't really need, uh, we don't have much leverage until you get to the point where the government needs another appropriations bill to pass the House and the Senate and be signed by the President. So that's about nine months, eight and a half months. Creations, the only fiscal bills that have to start in the House? No, appropriations do not have to start in the House. Um, tax revenue raising bills do. If my, I'm, I can't think right now what the uh, uh, specific words are in the Constitution. But yes, you're right. That's one of the few unique powers, um, one of the few powers unique to the House deprived of the Senate. So um, people who know more about this than I do might be able to say, oh, there's all kinds of things that uh, a Republican House and a Republican, excuse me, a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate might be able to do. Um, but I think I wouldn't underestimate the power of the cards being held by a Republican Senate. By McConnell. A senior Senator from Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm gonna be watching for the equivalent of the speech that Biden gives that Obama gave in April, mid April, 2009, um, because it's a uh, it's going to be a big deal to see how the to what lengths Biden is willing to go to restore the confidence um, and morale of career scientists who spend their lives in public service at the federal level and many of whom have been besieged, threatened with being fired or outright fired um, in a way that would have been astonishing in any of the uh, previous 44 administrations. As a gossip thing, um, Melania Trump and, and uh, Mrs. Obama have been a big gossipy thing about them. Anyone? What about Mrs. Biden? I don't even know her name. Jill. Dr. Jill. Dr. Yeah. Jill Biden. Professor at community colleges. It's going to be a, a very big deal for the people that are interested in um, higher education in specific, education in general. Um, to have the president's wife um, have that sway. She had a lot of sway under the Obama administration when she was the vice president's wife. Um, so I think uh, 
between the president's wife being a professor, especially at a community college and what that has for accessibility and affordability and um, the issue of long-term student debt for people who went through college um, and what the vice president elects parentage has to do with the idea that uh, you know, she grew up in university towns, including Madison and Montreal. Um, this is part of her upbringing as being around academics and scientists. Um, so I, I don't know what that'll be, but it's certainly different than most vice presidents. Yay, I've moved you to complete silence. Oh, well, we want to hey. know what Biden is going to appoint his children to anything. Say again? Want to know if Biden is going to appoint his children to anything. Yeah. Wow. There's a word for that, but I can't think of it right now. Nepotism. Anyway. Nepotism. Oh, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so today at five o'clock, we get to find out whether there's going to be a request for a uh, complete recount here in Wisconsin. When it costs over seven million, I think the guess is they're not going to ask. They've requested the recount in two counties and paid the three million dollars already. Dane and Milwaukee. Oh, I didn't know that there was an option to do it county by county. I thought they were, that they had yeah. sued I, rather than requested. I didn't either, but they've, they've done it. Wow, so they put down the, the money. Yeah, yeah, they, cool. they wired $3 million. Frankly, it's up to those guys that- the election commission. It's a bit. Well, it continues to unfold. I have vague memories now of exactly what happened in uh, November and December of 2000, but I lived only four blocks from the US Supreme Court and I was, um, you know, going back and forth from the House side to the Senate side because I lived over uh, by the Union Station and there were protests out there day by day. And then the night that they uh, released the five to four opinion was, it's a very bizarre thing, not knowing what's gonna happen. And now we have historical inevitability. It's like, well, yes, of course that's what happened. But at the time you don't know what's gonna happen. And uh, we're sitting here not knowing for sure what's gonna happen between now and the next two or three months. Well, uh, and then to throw in a pandemic that's killing a thousand people a day. Is that what we're at? Uh, uh, Trump there. is the only president that's refused to put up the portrait of his predecessor. So Obama's portrait, official portrait, has been done, but Trump has not allowed it to be hung. Well, um, Trump does have Andrew Jackson's up, and that's always been instructive to me that uh, he's fond of the bull in the China cabinet that Andrew Jackson was. And Andrew Jackson was very uh, pointedly that populist person uh, long ago, but he, you know, he defeated John Quincy Adams, um, unseated him because John Quincy Adams was going for a second uh, administration and Arguably, John Quincy Adams was the most highly educated, most well-prepared uh, president we'd ever had, with the possible exception of Jefferson. And uh, so the country has seen this rodeo before, but I don't remember it. That's not available on BCR. <laughs> All right, anything else? Let's remind people that there's no class next week. Okay. And uh, do watch for 
what unfolds, the names that get floated, the people that get confirmed. And one thing I didn't mention is uh, the, especially among the Democratic Party, I belong to no organized party, I'm a Democrat. Thank you, Will Rogers. Um, what will happen once those names start coming out because um, there will be people who are unhappy and this, the schisms and divisions within the Democratic Party uh, will start to develop in a way that may come into play. I don't know how that'll be, um, but that's something different. The, the Republicans tend to be, in, at least in my lifetime, tend to be more cohesive um, than the Democrats, um, not at primary time, but once they get elected, they tend to not have the same level of fracture that the Democrats have. Anyway. Will we have a meeting the, um, two weeks from tomorrow, today? Yes, on December 2nd, and then again on December 9th. Is that right, Paul? I believe that's right. December and December 2nd is the December 9th. And two more, right? Yeah, and Paul's bringing ice cream. Right. Serving it on video. <laughs> all right. Thank you all and, very much. Thank and you, Tom. For, for all the people who uh, have been in the class, we should be coming up with ideas for second semester and then we can submit them to me or submit them to Tom. Yep. Speakers you might want to hear or topics you might want to hear. All right. Thank you. Thank you all very much. See ya.